WNST, Towson Baltimore and Baltimore Positive. We are taking the Maryland Crab Cake Tour out on the road. I'm in the middle of this thing. I've only gained one pound. This is going to be a great segment, though, because this guy's going to have me gaining weight uh, just uh, thinking about his food and hearing his music. Uh, I've been trying to set up a crab cake uh, with the former Tim Camp, now known uh, universally as Slim Man Akati and the Slim Man. Uh, I see him all over Facebook. He plays beautiful music. He's going to be bringing his beautiful music to Annapolis this week in the middle of the Maryland Crab Cake Tour presented by the Maryland Lottery in conjunction with our friends at Goodwill, Window Nation, and the Restaurant Association of Maryland, where uh, we're hoping everybody gets out and supports local restaurants, local businesses from September 16th through the 25th of Restaurant Week all over the state of Maryland. But Slim is here not just to talk about cooking and uh, she's so nice, but also to promote uh, his music and playing his beautiful music down at Ramshead. Welcome home, brother. How are you? I know you have so many friends out in my Baltimore positive land, man. Uh, I'm good. It's great to be back in the hometown. It really is. Well, you know, home just... cooking means crab cakes, brother, right? Yeah. Well, I've got a crab cake recipe in my new cookbook. And it's it was... I, a friend of mine, Tom Alonzo, the keyboard player that used to play in boot camp, I was talking about how much I missed my hometown, like during the whole COVID thing. And so he sent me three pounds of back fin jumbo lump crab cake, uh, crab meat out to my uh, hometown, uh, my new hometown of Palm Springs, California. I had three pounds. So I thought I'd cook each pound a different way. So I tried it my way, which I used panko breadcrumbs as, as the filler, just basically. And then I tried it with uh, my, my bongo player, uh, Howard Zizzy, Hitman Howie Z. I tried it his way with saltines. And then my friend in uh, Ocean City, Maryland has this recipe that he insists is the best. He uses crushed up Lay's potato chips as his filler. Now, I thought it was going to be horrible, right? So I tried them. I that took sounds all not natural, dude. Did you just I put know, that on I my know. airwaves? Really? I I, so I made three pounds, right? One my way, one Howie's way, one uh, Clubby's way. And the one with the Lay's potato chips was hands down. It didn't taste like potato chips. It was so good. And I'm telling you, I've made it so many times. And people are always like, they don't say, oh, what's this taste of potato chips? It's just like, I don't know. They, they about, you know really I well. go to all these restaurants and, and everybody, it's like being on Guy Fieri, right? Like you want to guard your secret sauce or your secret slurry or, you know, whatever it is. Right. Um, I have not heard. I've never heard of that. Now, there is an Eastern Shore recipe that has a little cream involved in it. Um, and I think with slurries, there's so many different kinds of mustards and peppers, right? Like yeah. when I, I went I went to the, the most remote Maryland crab cake you can have last year in a town called Tylerton, Maryland. It is literally on Smith Island. And uh -huh. it is the most it, – it, it's the woman who makes the Smith Island cakes um, and her son – has a, a convenience store and he has a special recipe, black pepper. And I swear, I think he puts vanilla, like Madagascar kind of vanilla uh -huh. in some way. And I've heard of all sorts of, I mean, people use parsley and celery seed and uh, the Old Bay and J.O. and Chesapeake Bay and like all of that. Um, I had a crab cake the other day down in Potomac and it wasn't preferred for me. They put celery in it. They, they treated it like chicken salad. And yeah. I, that, that no good. No bueno for me. Yeah, I mean, the, for me, the, the thing that needs to stand out is the crab meat. You know what I mean? You can't have too much else going on. I always thought, you know, just just a couple of basic things along with the crab meat. That's all you need. Something to hold it together. And, you know, I, I've always preferred broiled, you know, the, the crab cakes to fried. However, in, in the new cookbook, my friend Club, Clubby Club, who's down in Ocean City, who puts the potato chips in it, he insists on frying his crab cakes. And I'm telling you. They my mom, I'm from Dundalk, right? So we grew up poor. I tell this story all the time, but we grew up with special crab meat, claw crab meat, right? Yeah. My mom made crab soup. We got crabs all the time. The little ones, we, my dad can never afford the $16 a dozen. We, you know, we did eight, 10, 12, you know, like I'm talking in the seventies here now, yeah, yeah. 108, 110, 112. But, um, but my mom would fry them like hockey pucks. My mom also made salmon cakes. She never made cotties. Now, you know, the, the way you would do it. And apparently that's part of the history of the Maryland crab cake in, in real terms is that mustard and the salt and the, and the cracker 
and French fries and coleslaw and serving it in markets like Fadley's where they do jumbo lump now and like all of that. Um, and the Fadley's folks told me they never thought jumbo lump would sell because they never thought anybody would pay a real premium price, you know, yeah. that you could make little fried crab cakes pretty inexpensively against the grain. So I grew up with them always fried. I had never had what I would call a country club crab cake, big, fluffy jumbo lump, that slurry, mustardy, mayonnaise, that light, eggy sort of thing going on. All of my crab cakes before I was 20 were fried hockey pucks. Literally. Yeah. That's why we ate them. Well, you know, but you know, the history of crabs, I mean, they used to be, I mean, they were considered, you know, food for, you know, the working class, they, you know, a lot of people who were, you know, up the ladder a little, little bit, so to speak. Well, you could catch what you ate, too. You could go out on a Saturday and feed your family crabs by going to the water and putting chicken necks in. Yeah, I know. That's the way we used to do it. Throw out chicken necks on a piece of string, reel them in real slow and scoop them up with a net. Used to do it all the time. And then we used to go soft shell crabbing, too, which is another, it's, it's an art in itself. But yeah, I mean, crabs weren't really considered Considered like the gourmet kind of thing that they are now. If you would have gone back 20, 30 years ago and said, you know, you're going to be paying $100 a dozen for crabs, people would look at you like you're crazy. And nobody would buy them, but you know how damn Boom. good they are. <laughs> yeah. Slim Man is here. He's Slim Man Akati, formerly known as the artist is uh, Tim, Tim Camp and Boot Camp back in my childhood. Dude, I don't know your story other than to know I was a fan of yours as a kid. I rediscovered you in the modern world as doing this really cool you know suave sort of jazz beautiful music sort of thing and tribute music and um i love that you live in palm springs i followed you a lot during covid where everybody was shut down and you were making i mean i would put you on as a little bit of a soundtrack and passing the cup and whatnot and you got you have such a beautiful baltimore accent that i knew we could have a crab cake together at some point but i i really don't know your story so i come today uh, offering beer and a crab cake uh, and uh, the promotion of your show uh, down at Ramshead this week. And I was at Ramshead last week. Um, I saw J.D. Souther, beautiful night, beautiful uh, Eagles music. What a talent. Uh, oh, my God, incredible. But your show is also spectacular. You travel the world, but you're home this week. And I wanted to talk about your cooking and your life and who you are and where you came from, because I really don't know the whole story. I just remember Tim Camp and Boot Camp, and you were – BFD back in the 80s, Timmy, right? Yeah, yeah, we were we we were doing pretty well back then. I mean, it's think about it. We were playing five, six nights a week, every week for years. And we were, you know, clubs were packed, Gerard's, Maxwell's, wherever we went, it was just we had, you know, we had two of the first hundred videos on MTV. I mean, things were popping, you know, it was really great. But that's that's really not how I got my start. I got my start. Well, you know, my family's Italian from Rome, went to New York. Uh, my grandmother got assigned. She was a labor organizer. She got assigned to the Baltimore uh, uh, Delmarva area. So she came down to Baltimore, brought the family. And this is where I was born. And my dad, when I was like five years old, took me to see a movie with Louis Armstrong. The movie was called The Five Pennies. And when I saw Louis Armstrong sing, and play the trumpet, I turned to my dad, I swear to God, I remember this, he's like, I, that's what I want to do, he's like, you're five years old, I said, yeah, but that's, that's, that's what I want to do, so he rented me a trumpet, you know, when I was like, I don't know, Jack, it, like, I was six years old, maybe he rented me a trumpet, and I learned how to play, and I learned how to sing, and pretty much taught myself the music, but it was Louis Armstrong that really got me into music, that was my first love was Lewis hearing him sing hearing him play just his vibe and I don't know I just to this day he's my one of my favorites well I mean you also grew up in an era where there was Elvis and the Beatles I mean you're, you're not an old timer you're a young old timer man. like you know and I, I would think in an immigrant family or whatever you, that they were being a pre like my I grew up in Dundalk and you know and my, my parents were older and you know from a different really a different era but I mean I had Bobby Vinton I had Engelbert Humperdinck, who I later played tennis with, and I have a great Engelbert Humperdinck story. If you want to listen to day one of the Crab Cake Tour, we told the we played tennis with Engelbert, hit him in the nuts with the tennis balls. A ter terrible story. And I saw Tom Jones singing about a month ago. A, a thing hit my timeline that he was singing, um, and I clicked on it, and I'm like. That's the, the, to me, that was the first music that was music to me before I discovered 
Afternoon Delight and Neil Diamond, if you know what I mean, and got to get you into my life in the Beatles in 1973, 74, and Linda Ronstadt. I've been cheated. Yeah. You know, so, like, so like all of that early part of that, I love Slim, man. I, I'm known for sports, but anybody would tell you I, I'm really a music fan i you know music's treated me better through all of my life all different kinds of music but it's fascinating how armstrong got a hold of you but you you were in a pop band i mean i knew you as as that not as yeah. okay I, I thought you grew up listening to zeppelin and smoke on the water and well, I, I did, you know late, later on later on is when i kind of got introduced to that music but you know when i was growing up it was it was pretty much similar to yours but on the other way around I was absolutely in love with music, but I grew up five minutes from Memorial Stadium. So I was a stadium rat. I was taking the number eight bus down York Road, going in, sneaking into the stadium, going in there, catching batting practice with my little glove. I was a junior Oriole. I was, you know, I was just a stadium rat for not only the Baltimore Orioles, but the Baltimore Colts. I would I would go to any and every game that I could. So it was every kid that grew up in that neighborhood tells me that story. My late friend, Batman, DJ Batman was a oh, yeah. close friend, grew up in the neighborhood there. Everybody in the neighborhood in, in the 60s and 70s, that was I was the kid that got on the 22 bus through Highland Town. And it was a destination on and off with my dad. I never saw the neighborhood. You know what I mean? But yeah. it was your neighbor. I always thought, my God, if I could just live here and walk to the games, it'd be the greatest thing ever. You know, I'd walk, I'd ride my bike. I'd take a bus. Memorial Stadium was my hang. I knew every, every ticket taker. I knew when to go, where to sit, what to do. It was just the Orioles and the Colts. Well, pretty much the Orioles when I was more so than the Colts, I got into them just, you know, a couple of years later, but Orioles, Colts, Memorial Stadium, that was my joy besides the music. Do you know what I mean? It right. was like music and then the O's and the Colts. Well, that sounds like my childhood right there. Uh, uh, the artist formerly known as Tim Camp. You remember Boot Camp? Uh, if you know Slim, Slim Man out on the internet doing his big show. Uh, what for, for you, this metamorphosis of music and you talk about the trumpet being a little boy and then you had the pop thing going on. And I mean, you've, you've written a lot of music in a lot of different ways. Your current what you're doing currently, you've been doing for a long, long time. Um, and it is it, it's sort of a unique act that you do, right? Yeah, I mean, it's a it's a it's a unique combination of like jazz and pop and soul. And it's all kind of wrapped up in that ball. And I've been doing that since, uh, you know, well, when I got signed to Motown as a songwriter back in whatever it was, 78, 79, I got signed as a songwriter to Motown. And one of the first songs that I wrote was for a gal that sang a combination of jazz, pop and soul. Her name was Angela Bofill and her first album did really well. She was a jazz artist. So it was, you know, it was a little small world, but it was that same kind of stuff that I'm doing now was the same kind of stuff that I started writing when I was a writer at Motown. That was my first job was writing for Motown records back in like 78, 79. And so the stuff that I was doing then is pretty much the stuff that I'm doing now. It's, you know, I, I like to take the you know, the sophistication, the chords and the, you know, the, the musical sophistication of jazz. I like the access, accessibility of pop. And I love the, the, like the feeling of soul where this, you know, like, I think that's, that's what really hooked me on Louis Armstrong was he just had so much soul. You couldn't help but listen to his voice and feel something here. You know what I mean? It was like a definite soul connection. So yeah, the Slim Man stuff is a combination of jazz and pop and soul. And that's really kind of, I kind of rolled it up all together and that's really was pretty much the start of it all. Making a life in music, man, not easy to do. I have a lot. I mean, I, 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 Rob Fay, he's a friend of mine with the Ravens, Keith Brewer. I've known him forever. You know, I was the music critic at the Evening Sun back in the late 80s into the early 90s. And I, I wrote about bands and I uh, have a lot of friendships. I'm still real close with the guys in the Smithereens and a couple of other bands that I've uh, stayed friends with through all these years. Um, it, 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 it's quite a journey. But as an artist, it's also a calling, right? Guys your age still doing this, going out, touring, um, you know, making your coin, doing what you're doing. You're doing cookbooks. The Internet has opened up a world for anybody of any age who's talented to find an audience and create an audience and cultivate an audience and a brand. And I think that's a beautiful part of music, but I mean, a very, very difficult journey when you're talking about getting signed to, to contracts and record deals back in the day where 
artists didn't really come first ever really no i mean you know it, it's it, the the music business has had a history of not treating its artists very fairly. I mean, even look at Motown and Barry Gordy. He signed so many great writers and so many great artists. As soon as their contracts were up, they left because his contracts were so one sided. Even when I when I signed with Motown as a songwriter, my attorney who who represented also represented Miles Davis. I mean, he was a pretty big guy, and he said you know, this is not the greatest deal in the world. And I said, yeah, but it's Motown. Do you know what I mean? Just because of that. that Bright lights, right? Yeah, yeah. I was like, yeah, okay, I'll sign it anyway. But it was great. I mean, it, but yeah, the, the, the music business has had a history of not treating its artists fairly and people always have to fight to get paid. And it's been, and it's been a struggle for, you know, even on a, on a large level, like you look at what happened with Prince and Warner Brothers, how mad he was at his record deal. They wouldn't let him, you know, do kind of what he wanted to do. So it's, you know, it's a, it's a complicated relationship between the record business, the music business and the artists that, you know, that are involved in it. But I tell you what, on Saturday night when I'm having a beer, <laughs> sipping, listening to Slim Man, sing some songs down in Annapolis, Ram said, yeah, yeah, promote your show a little bit. Tell me about your where you are right now and folks that come out uh, to support you. Obviously, Baltimoreans would know you. It is a bit of a homecoming for you. You got your cookbook and whatnot. We'll get to the cooking in a minute because that's the fun part of the show. But just the music and, and getting on stage and making a living this way and keeping it great for you and for the audience. You know, I'm... Um I'm, I'm really proud. Uh, I have always taken great pride in the musicianship of the guys in my band. And, and on Saturday at the Ramshead, August 20th, Ramshead Annapolis, you know, the piano player, he is just one of the best you'll ever hear. If you sat down and listened to him, you go, where did this guy come from? The saxophone player, Kevin Levi is the same way. Uh, Howard Zizzi on the bongos. He's just got such a great feel. Johnny Cole on drums. And he makes his own drums by hand. He's got such a great sound and drum kit, and he plays with such feel and such heart and soul. And I'm really proud of this band. We've got some another Baltimore guy that flew in from the West Coast, Shay Welsh, is going to play guitar that Saturday. And we've got a great band called the Hazel Rig Brothers that are going to open up. So, I mean, it, it, for me, that hour and a half on stage is just glorious. The, the 22 hours it takes to get to there, that's, that's what I get paid for, not that hour and a half on stage. That hour and a half on stage is just the best. And we always, you know, I always take great pride in, in the, not only the performance, but, you know, the quality of the sound and the lights and, you know, doing my absolute best to make sure that every show is going to be the best. And that's what we're looking forward to at the at the Ram set. And not only that, I mean, I get to play my own music, songs that I've written. I get to play with my best friends. And it's just, it's just, it's just wonderful. And well, hey, man, and you get to cook good food. Come back home and get some real crab meat. Slim Man Akati, the Slim Man, he is our guest. Uh, you can follow him out on Facebook, on social media, everywhere. Uh, obviously, uh, making great music, and he's going to be down at Ramshead. But more than that, the cookbook, right? So when I thought of you, and I thought about, uh, I may be doing an Angelina's crab cake this weekend, so I'm a little bit excited about that, uh, because that was sort of my favorite, favorite crab cake as a kid. And uh, There's still a guy that sells them on the internet. It might be happening on Saturday before or after your show i'm spending uh my saturday my childhood band child's place having their one and only reunion in baltimore so i want to give a shout out to johnny allen but also uh for slim and you play here about every year right you you come yeah, in well, a lot year. right and about child's play you know um brian jack and i we live together i mean i wrote all of the songs on his first solo album as well as produced that album brian jack and i were best of friends we lived together for a couple of years down on sioux creek in beautiful essex maryland so uh, yeah, I, I'm very familiar with Child's, Child's Play. I, I was familiar with them. A friend of mine was working at Chrysalis Records when he got signed, a guy named Patrick Clifford. But Brian Jack, yeah, I was a huge fan. What charisma, what a voice, you know, what a, what a great group of musicians that he had surrounded you know, it's interesting with Brian, and I, and I, I, I thank you for that, and I want to talk to you about that because that would be important to me. I'm glad you, you offered that. I, that would have been terrible for us to not discuss it. Um, 
and, and obviously it's the same night as your show. And this one's downtown, two different audiences. But um, John Allen is one of my best friends. I mean, we've grown up, we've known each other all of our lives. We've known each other since we're 10 years old. Uh, we've been friends forever. And and Idzi and, and Nikki Kay as well, childhood yeah. friend. We were all in the seventh grade together at Holliburton Middle School. So I've known them my whole life and since 1979. Um, but Brian... I had a band called Ridgemont High at the turn of the century. I always say my wife was the Yoko Ono, broke the band up. We got married, uh, you know, but it was a fun gig. And we did 80s, uh, you know, skinny tie uh, in excess, uh, you know, kind of, yeah. you know, that we did 80s lover boy. We did music. Right. And I sang in the band and we played out in Ellicott City one night. And um, this is to this is turn of the century, 2001, 2002. And Brian's there. And Brian's like in the crowd, like dancing, having a good time. And he, you know, he was loose that night, let's just say. And he came up and he said to me, he was always loose. He came up and he said, hey, man, what are you going to do in the encore, man? What, what songs you guys do? And Paul Lamantia is my guitar player, also does a fantastic job with my hair. Uh, gentleman's gentleman, Chopper Road. Um, and I said, we're going to do uh, Rebel Yell, Billy Otto. He said, oh, man, can I, can I get on and do it with you guys? And I'm like. Hell yeah, man. Brian Jack and my band tonight, man, he got up and it was like we were at the garden at 1.35 a.m. in Ellicott City on a Saturday night. So I got to sing a song with Brian Jack. So uh, that means the world to me. I don't think I've ever told that story in the air. So thank you for that. And I did not know that you were um, that you were roomies with him. So um, uh, yeah, I mean, and- back when Charles play broke up, I mean, I I. I- I had heard of him and I went and I, and I met him and I brought him into the studio and his voice was just miraculously wonderful and his charisma and his style and his, I just loved it all. And we did like a 10 song CD that, uh, that created a big stir. I mean, we got uh, the interest of D Anthony, who was a big manager. I called up D and D had managed uh, Frampton, uh, the, you know, all these incredible Jay Giles band. And D was the one who hooked him up with, uh, with, sony epic records so you know when i when i did the album with brian jack i turned around and went to d and said you know what this is some guy you might want to manage and d signed him to a management company and d was about as big as you could get back in the day his daughter was head of sony and uh, he uh you know like i said he managed jay giles frampton yeah what do you listen to? You you still? I mean, I know what you play, but you you drop all this. Me, I'm I'm such a classic rock goober, right? Like you know anything from the '70s and early '80s. I I went and saw Sticks and Ario Speedwagon and Loverboy the other night, and ha- had a moment with Mike Reno from Loverboy. So I, you know that that that's the music. That's the soundtrack of my. I, I'll listen to new music. My I like music, but w- when it comes down to like travel time. I, you know, that, that's, that's my binky. That's my classic rock is my go-to, you know? Yeah. Well, I mean, you know, for me as well, I love that whole era. I mean, I think it all, the the reason what happened was the, the, the time that I actually had this accidental meeting with Jimi Hendrix was a time that really changed my whole life around. He came to the civic center, Um, a, a friend of mine, I was living in Govins, (laughs) <laughs> you know, Baltimore, right? Little working class section. Hey, man, I had a beer there the other night at Full Tilt and a delicious meal at Heritage. A great hey, barbecue so, there. So I, so um, uh, he brought over this Jimi Hendrix album, and then he's like, he's coming to town. I'm like, I'm going. So um, I got tickets, and I and I was the first in line. I mean, there was I got there that afternoon, right? So me and my friend, we were sitting there. We ha- had we had the hairdos all dressed up like we were in the Jimi Hendrix experience. They opened the doors and I said to my friend, look, we're going to sneak backstage and we're going to pretend we're part of the crew. And he's like, what? I said, yeah, we're going right up on stage. We're just going to walk up there like we own the place. So we walked up onto the stage and uh, uh, they were getting all ready to get set up. And so I was on one side of the stage behind the curtain at the Civic this is at Center. at the Civic Center, right? Okay. On the other right. side. And then like... Cactus, a band named Cactus was opening up. This great rock band, a, a Bogart on bass. So anyway, I'm standing there watching Cactus. I feel this tap on my shoulder and I hear this voice say, you know, that guitar player is pretty good. It's Jimi Hendrix. So I'm shoulder to shoulder with Jimi Hendrix for 20 minutes and we're watching Cactus. And it was a life-changing experience. When Hendrix came out and I saw him, I was like, that is incredible and then like the, the next week or two i went to merriweather and i saw led zeppelin open up for the who 
which is the only time that Led Zeppelin has, has ever done that. And those within like, think about it, within two weeks, I saw three amazing bands. And then uh, 1969, I, was, I just Googled yeah. this. I Googled it, May 25th, 1969, Zeppelin at Maryland. And I've seen the posters for that and uh, you yeah, know, sort of the rare ticket stubs and all that. But yeah. dude, you were doing it when men were walking on the moon. Slim, come on. Yeah. I know. And and then so um <clears throat> is there, but the 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 final thing to this story is I was living in Nashville before I moved to Palm Springs. I was there for three, four years, and there was this crazy little uh um grocery store like down in the in the ghetto right and i'm there getting whatever beer or whatever and and i see robert plant this is like maybe 10 years ago robert plant right behind me in line he's got like a 12 pack of miller high life beer right and so and nobody knew who he was because we were you know it's nashville too people blend yeah. in. so yeah. anyway so I walked up to him and I said, look, I, I know that nobody knows who you are. I said, but I, you know, I know who you are. And, and I said, I just want to thank you. I, I saw. That's a, a song. Of, uh, <laughs> <laughs> he opened with that last time I saw him with pain. Yeah. So, um, <laughs> so I said, I want to thank you. He said, he said, why? I said, well, I saw you open up for the who. And I just thought that, you know, I just want to thank you. It, it had a profound effect on my life. And he said, I never wanted to do that show. And I was like, why he goes i always thought we were better than the who <laughs> <laughs> i said i said yeah you were but <laughs> no. but anyway yeah so like uh, you know what i mean like th it, there was that shift that i you know when after i saw hendrix and saw led zeppelin i'm like a whole other world opened up to me and and, and it was just from that from that point it was uh, led zeppelin hendrix the doors. I saw the doors at Merriweather. I saw them at the Civic Center. You know, I, it just opened up this whole world that was just, I don't know, it's just a great time. Probably the greatest time for rock music ever was the late 60s. You think about what was happening with the Beatles, Led Zeppelin, Hendrix, the doors. I mean, it's Woodstock 69. I mean, it's just this amazing time for rock music, the most amazing ever in the, in the history of the world. That those couple of years, late 60s. Slim Man telling stories of Child's Play, Jimi Hendrix, and Led Zeppelin. We're going to have him back. I need a crab cake with Slim. Slim's playing uh, down at Annapolis at Ramshead on uh, Saturday night. If you remember the music of Boot Camp at Tim Camp, that's him. Uh, and obviously, uh, the cookbook also. Cooking uh, Italian. I'm half Italian, half Venezuelan. I've been doing this crab cake tour. I, I like to cook. I mean, I'm a good cook, decent cook when I cook. Um, I prefer to sort of study and discover what's going on out here. The crab cakes were really begat as a sort of a political experience to go out and chat with people and knowing that every crab cake would be different. Every single one I have every night is different from the last one in preparation and ingredients and all that, man, you're, you are a real chef. You love to cook. You have a cookbook. Tell me about that passion aside from the music and you uh, doing uh, the various things with salmon I see on the internet. Yeah. Well, you know, I'm, I'm not a, I'm not a chef. I'm a cook. There's a different, you know, chef wears, ha wear hats and go to school. I'm just trying to figure out, you know, what is the best thing for me to cook. And I come up with my own recipes and the, how I got started was, you know, I'm Italian. I'm actually an Italian citizen. And uh, so most of my experience was Italian food growing up, but you know, the, when I started cooking was when I started like the band and you're like, you know, you're 18, 19 years old. You got five bucks between the five of you and you're like, we're starving. What do you do? What do you do? You go get some olive oil, you get some garlic, you get some vegetables, you get some pasta and you throw it all together. And that's really kind of how I got started was, you know, feeding the band. Uh, it, it just seemed to be a whole lot better alternative than just eating pizza every night. So I would, I started cooking for the band. So, if, you know, I, I'd make, I'd make pesto sauce for the band. You know, I'd make a, you know, I'd make shrimp marinara for the band. I, I was making. I want to be in your band. <laughs> yeah. <laughs> yeah. Like last night, like last night, the keyboard player and the drummer came over just, you know, to hang out and talk about the show this Saturday at the Ram said, and I made a, uh, I made homemade pesto and with shrimp and farfalle pasta. And I made a uh, chicken breast uh, with, a uh, 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 with a uh, fontina cheese and uh, a tomato sauce on top, so good. So anyway, it continues to this day where I'm still trying to feed the band and while we're talking about music and while we're relating about what we're gonna do and how we're gonna do each show. 
I can't let you go without talking about Palm Springs. Uh, I've been, it's like, oh, it's just, I've been everywhere, man. I've been, I, I feel like I've been everywhere, but I haven't been. There's a few places in America still I, I have yet to hit. Uh, I haven't been to Reno. I haven't been to Tahoe. I haven't been to Palm Springs. Essentially, there hasn't been a baseball game there or football because I did sports forever, right? So there, I've been to LA a million times. I've been to San Diego a million times, been to Phoenix a million times, been to Vegas, million, but never sort of out. I, I really have a, 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 it's on the list. I got to get there and I got to get there when the weather's decent. I have a, my yoga instructor for my, who uh, was my yogini. Um, she is there doing art and, and practice is still in Palm Springs. She moved there. So I really need to get out and reconnect with her. Make a case for Palm Springs beyond uh, the rat pack and what it is. What am I going to find when I come to Palm Springs? Cause I'm, I'm really looking forward to it. I don't know why, but I'm going to get there. And Santa Fe is also on the list. Marvin Lewis is dragging me out there, but I, I've, I've got to get to Palm Springs. I know I need to be there. Tell me why. Well, you know, it, it's, a, it's a great it's a great town. Um, it got its start um, when um, the, the actors and actresses that were under contract, they had to be within 100 miles of Hollywood so that if they had to get called back to do voiceovers or do a reshoot or to do another scene in a movie. So they, they were under contract to be 100 miles from Hollywood. So a lot of the Hollywood studios Palm Springs is 100 miles from Hollywood, almost exactly. So what they would do is they'd build these little mo uh, modern cottages, not big places. And, and that's how it got its start. So, you know, a lot of movie stars would go there to hang out, you know, because it was the, it was 100 miles from Hollywood. They could get out of the Hollywood, you know, noise and stuff. And if they ever needed to be called back to do voiceovers, you know, another scene. So that's how... It was a place to get left alone, literally. Yeah, exactly. Okay. And then, you know, guys like Frank Sinatra started making it their permanent residence. And so you started, he started dragging all Dean Martin, Elvis Presley, you know, everybody's Bob Hope. Bob Hope, you know, lived there for most of his life. And then a lot of the presidents would retire there, Eisenhower, Gerald Ford. That's where Betty Ford started. The Betty Ford Clinic was, you know, in, in Palm Springs. And it's, it's, the weather is beautiful eight months of the year. It is it's a desert. So, you know, there's a lot of sand. And then on this each side, you have these mountain ranges. And in, in, in like December, January, February, the mountains are all covered with snow and you're down on the desert floor and it's 80 degrees and dry and wonderful. And it's just really marvelous. Of course, in the summertime, when I left there, it was 112 degrees. When I was working on my last album, I got out of the studio a year and a half ago. 122 degrees in the summertime so eight months of the year it's wonderful and there's a, you know there's still a lot of, it's becoming a, a, a there's a renaissance in palm springs because a lot of people from are getting disenchanted with Lo los angeles so expensive and all the homeless problems and same thing with san francisco so a lot of people are going to palm springs which is a lot less expensive and it's starting to uh, get a new resurgence of people. Kim Kardashian just bought a place there. The guy from Maroon 5, Adam, whatever his name is, bought a place there. Uh, you know, uh, Gary Oldham, the, the actor. So it's getting this new resurgence. It's, it's a nice place. It really is. But it, there is a lot of, you know, a, a lot of Hollywood there still and a lot of uh, golfing. And, you know, there's, there's a lot of retirees as well. Well, I'm going to come out there and breathe the fresh air. Uh, one oh, of these the, the air is amazing. Yeah, yeah. I mean, I, the air is okay all over California in the south part as long as you're away from the smog. So, yeah. yeah. I mean, uh, I, every, time I, I, every time I drive to the airport in San Diego, my aunt lived in San Diego, right by San Diego State. So I had a good childhood. So I would go out there, and every time I go to the airport, I smell the air coming off the five when I'm in San Diego, and I look out, you know, uh, over, you know over the island, and I say, you know, ah, man, I can't believe I'm leaving here again. You know what I mean? It's the hardest yeah. thing to do is leaving. Well, we're glad to have you back home. Um, hold the cookbook up. Tell everybody how they can find the cookbook because I, I know you love selling that. Yeah, it's uh, slimman.com. And uh, this is the second cookbook. This is volume two. It just came out in January. It's got 30 recipes and 30 story stories about growing up in Baltimore, Story about, stories about how I got started in the music business. And there's also... 30 videos every uh, every recipe has a qr code which takes you to a um 
It takes you to like a like a there's the QR code. Nice, I see that. All right. And that and then it takes you to a two minute video of me showing you how to cook that dish. Hold that so, up again. Let me see if I can do that with my phone. If we do we I mean let's, let's see if we can get real and we can get we can get particular with that. Hold that up. Let me see. Let me see if it, it you have to talk in order for it to work. So yeah, if you're talking, so, I'll do it. Yeah, there's the QR code. And if you scan I got it, it, I got it, I got it. It came right up, it popped right up. I got your video right here. Yeah, I'm, I, 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 yeah, there you go. There he is right there. There's your video. All right. So that, that's how easy that was. All right. Yeah. So people can watch every, every recipe has a QR code. So you can watch a video of me. Slim Shady's trailer park in Palm Springs right here. It says so. That's I'm it. Watching. That's yeah. the spot. Nice. Well, dude, I got to get out, man. You're cooking some chickpeas here right now. A chickpea salad. So uh, uh, that's what you share with me. I appreciate you. You should come on the show more often, dude. I got to clean you. You got to come on two, three times a year, man. Yes, you got to talk about food. I'm a big fan of yours. I've been following you for years. I do appreciate you having me on the show. And it's finally, the finally connect is really wonderful for me. Yeah, man. We got to go. We got to have a crab cake or something. Slim man, go find him out on Facebook. Find him out on social media. Find his cookbook, volume one or two, the chickpeas. Uh, I love chickpeas. I mean, I love lentils. I'm, I'm a big legume fan, even though I'm eating a lot of crab cakes and drinking a lot of beer this month. People are worried about me. Uh, I'm going to a bar every night. Uh, it's breweries, crab cakes. It's all brought to you by our friends the Maryland Lottery. Uh, I'm giving away some scratch-offs. I, I grabbed them. Uh, they were in my bag a minute ago, but I didn't have them. I wanted to show them off, uh, but uh, but no, they're in my other bag. But I have them. I'll have them at Costas with Westmore on the 30th. I will have them in Eldersburg at Lee Tories on the 20. Uh, let me get the dates right, so I'm not saying the wrong things on the radio here like a fool. The 24th will be at Lee Tories. That's a Wednesday. The 26th will be at Rock Salt Grill. That's Friday, uh, and we got great guests. We're down at the beach all week. Salisbury, Ocean City. Uh, Slim's doing his thing in Annapolis uh, on Saturday night. Get down and check him out. We'll get crab cakes and fun. It's all brought to you by Goodwill, Window Nation, and our friends at the Restaurant Association of Maryland. Nothing more important than supporting local restaurants all over the state during Restaurant Week. That's September Absolutely. 16th to the 25th. Save yourself a few bucks, Slim, man. Everybody's showing off on Restaurant Week, man. $20 lunch, $30 dinner. We're going to do four courses. We're doing things. So everybody's doing something cool. Get out and support those folks right after the football season begins. I'm Nestor. We are WNST, AM 1570. Towson, Baltimore. I knew that segment would be good. We never stop talking. Baltimore positive. Stay with us. <laughs>